Good morning. Good morning. It's indeed a pleasure to see all of you this morning as we get closer and closer to that time when we've been celebrating this last month, this season of Advent, as we get ready for the birth of our Lord and Savior. We've got a wonderful sunny plan for you. I hope you sit back and enjoy it as the kids are going to present uh, their program here in a, just a bit later. If you're watching online, we're glad that you've taken this time to sit back and, and worship with us. We invite you to use the comment section that when we come to our time of prayer, if you would put in there any prayer concerns that you have or any joys that you would like to share, we would love to lift those up with our own congregation and share those with you. And as you uh, come into your time of prayer, whenever that is, and you know, Lynn sends out the daily announcement, uh, the uh, prayer concerns and, and uh, the activities of the church, we simply ask that you keep that in a, in a place where wherever you go for your daily prayer so that it would be readily available to you and that you can lift those, these individuals up in prayer as well. we got a, a wonderful day, and we're just going to get to it. We can unite our voices together in our opening prayer. Holy God, your prophet Micah foretold with faith that a new ruler would come from Bethlehem. Today we celebrate the fulfillment of your promise. Your daughter Elizabeth proclaimed with faith that her cousin was to be the mother of her Lord. Today we celebrate the fulfillment of your promise. Your servant Mary proclaimed with faith that she would be called blessed by all generations. Today we celebrate the fulfillment of your promise. Make us bold enough to proclaim with faith the coming of your kingdom, the coming of your justice, the coming of your peace. May we sing out the good news of your salvation, trusting in fulfillment of your promises. All this we pray in the name of one who comes. Amen. The Blessing of Home from Micah chapter 5, verses 2 through 5a. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will re reach to the ends of the earth. And he will be our peace when the Assyrians invade our land and march through our fortresses. From Luke chapter 1, verses 39 to 45. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, <clears throat> the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Sometimes when we are trying something new, or when we are facing a difficult decision, or when we want to celebrate something, or when we just feel lost and alone and uncertain about life, the universe and everything, we need a blessing. We don't always think of it that way or word it like that, we, what we need advice or support or companions or someone to come along beside and lift us up again so we can see more than the tops of our shoes. We seek a blessing. For many of us, we go home. We ask mom, we talk to dad or brothers and sisters, close friends, those we grew, those we grew up with, those who know us best. We want them alongside. We want them to be in their we want them to be in their presence. Somehow we know that being there, being home will make all things better. Maybe it won't be fixed or solved or wished away, 
but at least we won't be alone. We seek a blessing. Mary, faced with an incomprehensible burden and gift, ran to Cousin Elizabeth's house, looking for someone who knew a little of what she was going through, looking for a place to hide until the reality of her condition could become something real. And she received a blessing. The prophet Micah spoke of a blessing coming to an unexpected place, an unassuming town. Yet by God's grace would become the means through which God would bless the whole world. Bethlehem, the little town of blessing. We seek a blessing. We light these candles, the candle of hope, of peace, of joy, and of today, love as a sign that we know blessing and we know waiting for blessing <clears throat> to be felt and lived. We light these candles as a sign that we will still seek a blessing and it's time to go home. Thank you, Melinda and Deb for that Advent reading. I want to make sure we invite you all to our candlelight 11 o'clock service on Christmas Eve. I think we'll have a, a, another special program, and, and you'll want, not want to miss that. We won't be taking an offering at today. Today's uh, also time for a noisy offering. That noisy offering is going to go to the food pantry. On Christmas Eve, we always designate our offering on Christmas Eve to go to the Bishop's Children's Emergency Fund. Uh, and again, just to remind you what, what those funds are used for, it goes into our camping ministries. Uh, it goes into... Uh, local outreach pro uh, projects uh, goes to the United Methodist Advance, and it goes to um, those special funds that the bishop has uh, that comes up uh, on an emergency basis for children. Uh, and so I invite you to, uh, to remember that uh, emergency fund. We continue to monitor the, the COVID situation. You know, we are uh, not a mask mandated uh, in, in here. Uh, we feel that... Uh, make that decision on your own. We do have masks available for those that never got them. It's the uh, mask provided by the United Methodist Church. Love your neighbor. Uh, we still have a few of these left. Uh, if anybody wants to see me after worship uh, that needs uh, a mask for where they go, there are still places that are requiring masks when you enter them. And so if you'd like a mask, see me after worship. I invite you now to sit back. Let's prepare our hearts and our minds, our spirits, as we go into an attitude of worship as we listen to our prelude followed by our praise team.
Thanks, Steph. That was beautiful. Good morning. First of all, um, <clears throat> I'd like to say it's wonderful to see all the kids here today. Um, so to those parents and grandparents who dragged them out of bed this morning and who fought with costumes or whatever else they're doing, thank you, because they are a blessing to all of us. We hear often in church that God is good all the time. But our desires may not be granted at the time we want it. However, when God works, it's always perfect timing. Think about the timing involved with the birth of Jesus, from Elizabeth and Zechariah to Mary and Joseph to the birth in Bethlehem. God's timing was just right. Have faith and believe that God is good all the time. Will you stand and join us this morning? God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time. Through the darkest night, His light will shine. God is good. God is good all the time. Sing. God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time.
seated. We're going to a time of prayer and again invite you. There are prayer cards in the basket back by the soundboard. We encourage you to fill those out. Uh, let us know. Turn them into the office. Turn them in the basket there. We want to be able to lift up your prayer concerns, um, whatever they may be, or share the joys that you may have. Uh, the prayer concern that has been turned in is for uh, Brian Thacker, Jeff's uh, brother, uh, it's not been feeling well. Tests are being done now to figure out what exactly is going on, but that would be Brian Thacker. Um, again, you have the list from, from Len that goes out, uh, and we just uh, invite you to keep all those individuals in your prayer concerns as well. Um, let's sing our prayer hymn. We'll sing that through uh, one verse, and then we'll go into a time of silence, allowing you to lift up your concerns that you may have, uh, or simply sit back and listen for God to speak to you. I'm sorry, it's just so great to see kids in church today. But let's pray. Loving God, even in the midst of this season of goodwill, there is much to confess. In spite of the holiday cheer, stress and anxiety rule our lives. We miss the reason for the season, focusing instead on, on Christmas parties and, and long to-do lists and trying to get all the shopping done. We failed we failed to think about your reordered world, a world where the lowly are lifted up and the hungry are filled with good things. Our prayer today is that you would help us adjust our Christmas priorities, that we might join with you, O oh God, in preparing a world that welcomes the one who brings us peace. So today we gather here in this holy place, with your people. We sing our praises, we offer our gifts, we give you thanks, but now we come to you and we bring to you our prayer concerns. We lift up to you, Gene Rust, Laura Billick, Frank Schultz, 
John Riley, Ryan Everidge, Vicki Trebeau, Roger DeYoung, Patrice Freestone, Opal Brass, Gordon Reske, Mitch Nicolet, Simon, Gale, Ted Urbanski, John Sturt, Debbie Martin, Emily Rutledge, Wendy Daly, Barb Rust, Mary Max, Amy Blinko, Erna Ritter, Gail Tokars, Gary Marshall, Jonathan Bell, Brian Thacker. Those are names that have been brought to us, listed in our bulletin, or brought to us as prayer concerns. Holy God, we ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on those individuals, those families. We pray that you would be with the people who brought these prayer concerns to you, that you would surround them with your presence. That in the midst of whatever is going on, they would feel your presence and in that presence find hope and faith and peace. Lord God, we continue to pray for our nation as, as this pandemic continues to surge, uh, continues to, to take on different, different forms. God, we just continue to pray for our medical professionals, our hospitals, the staff that work there, the first responders. We ask that you protect them as only you can. We pray for our leaders then at all levels of government to help them make the right decisions, decisions that affect all of us. And we pray for those who have been hit hard by the recent wrath of tornadoes, the loss of lives, the loss of homes. God, in the midst of that valley, surround those families and let them know that in the midst of where they find themselves, loss of so many things, some of lost of loved ones, that you have not forsaken them, that you are walking with them, that you are there in the midst of their pain, that you are there with them. Lord God, we pray for our young men and women in the armed forces and, and pray that you would do your best to keep them from harm's way. We pray to their families as this particular time of year that when, when families are supposed to be together, they may find themselves separated. Lord God, we pray that in the midst of that separation, they would still remain faithful and, and to you that, that they would feel your presence and that presence would guide them. Lord God, we know that there are prayer concerns that have not been lifted up. We take a moment of silence for, for those individuals gathered here and online watching with us that, that they would lift those concerns up. Lord God, we pray all these things in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior. As we get ready to celebrate his birth, we remember the words that he taught us as we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. ever notice that that group singing has largely become a lost art and uh, in, unless you were part of that that greatest generation you may remember the times of of sitting around a, a piano in someone's living room or or in 
uh, a church hall uh, and doing those, those group sing-alongs. But for those of us that are younger than that, that, that is an art that has mainly been lost. Unless, unless of course, they're, well, they're outside of, of church singing. There are really only four occasions that, that we agree to, to take out our earbuds, lay down our, our smartphones, and and agree to, to join in, in, in those singing occasions. Now, you really know what those four occasions are. Now, the first one is National Anthem. Now, I mean, and we're going to get to all of them. The National Anthem is one that you remember. Whenever, you know, the, the 4th of July celebration, whenever we, the flag is paraded by, now, most of us here will gather, will stand and raise and and take appropriate uh, position to hand over our hearts. Most of us will sing the words. It, it's interesting how, how so many people today tend to forget what those words are. But, but the national anthem is one of those occasions when we agree to raise our voice up and sing. And the second one, or another one, is what? Seventh inning stretch, right? Take me out to the ball game. Well, again, it's, you know, we're, we're not afraid. To, no matter how bad a singing we are, Doug, this even the time, where'd Doug go? Where, I can even even sing with that one, and nobody's going to complain. Um, and not that they complain anyway. Not that you complain anyway, Doug. But third one, what? New Year's Eve, right? Audelon sang. Man. Even, even the champagne will help get those words out a little bit better. But, and then, of course, someone said, you know, the fourth one is happy birthday. You know, we're, we're ready to sing that, those words to that, that guest of honor as, as that guest of honor gets ready to, to blow out the candles on his or her cake. And realize that for some time, for a long time, that couldn't happen in restaurants because of, of copyright law. But once that, that song became in the public domain, became more and more uh, singing and more and more people joining in there because there's something, there's something personal, there's something intimate about a, a singing happy birthday to you because it indicates that that w when we're singing that to whoever that person is, it indicates that, that we know them, that we have a, a, a relationship with them, except maybe in, in the restaurant settings where the restaurant staff and, and, and even people in other booths and uh, chairs sitting around you might join in on that singing. Um, for those that are with that person celebrating that occasion, there's an indication that there's a relationship. There's a personal relationship we we want to, to make it a personal way. Now, now there may be other times when, when we observe birthdays, and, but we really don't remember them. We only, we only observe them because they, they give us a, a, a day off of work, a holiday. We fall on a Monday, and, you know, and so we celebrate some of those birthdays, like, like George Washington or Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King. We, and, and if it wasn't for the day that, that we, we get a day off at work, um, we may not observe them very much at all. And then there's the one that we get ready to celebrate here at the end of this week, Christmas. The irony there is that, you know, we celebrate that on December 25th, and nobody really knows when Jesus was born. Um, yeah, December 25th was chosen for one reason, and that was the early church needed to, to have something to... To, uh, to go against, if you will, or to, to blunt the impact of, of the Roman pagans celebrating the winter solstice. And, so, and so the early church established this date that we all celebrate now as, as the birth of Christ. While they celebrated the coming of the Son, we celebrated the Son of Righteousness. Remember that day then. That celebration, that first birthday celebration. Mary and Joseph, the only family members gathered there. There were there other people tipped off by angels. The shepherds had, had made their way down and, and were celebrating with them this scene in, in Bethlehem in the stable. Low key, probably intimate in, in, in its own way. But probably very low key, considering that we're celebrating the birth of the Savior. Didn't get much of it. There was a birthday song, but it, it wasn't happy birthday to you as Gloria and Excelsa Dale. 
And then think about how Mary and Joseph received that child. Was it, was it a, a, a glorious celebration? Was it a, a joyous celebration? Or was it a burden? I mean, we celebrate it, but back then, was it a, 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 a concern? Was it a burden? Was it a time of, of anxiety? Because you know, most, most births for a moment are at least full of joy, right? Most of them are, are joy that, that even when the most anxious, most impoverished mother finds some way to celebrate that joyous occasion, to, to marvel at this, this gift of life, to, to cradle that newborn in her arms. But you know, as, as we journey through life, Burdens start, uh, birthdays start to become a burden, don't they? I mean, as, as those birthdays start piling up one upon another, there are some people who even start to dread that day. Because birthdays, one, is their acknowledgement of, of who we are. Their acknowledgement of, of the passage of time. And there are some of us who simply are not happy about this, this thing about growing old. I mean, there's something, think about those that are celebrating their, their 100th birthday and what that can be like. And even those times when it makes the newspapers, and even as, as we gather around, as if it may be one that we are in relationship with, that as we celebrate that, that special occasion and, and, and that time is filled with joy, there's also this, this sense of how many more birthdays will there be? And the fact that, that most of the acquaintances, the friends of, of this person, are no longer around to celebrate. Or as those birthdays pile up, it starts to be a time when it's not a, gr- a joyous occasion. It's a time of how many, how many of these occasions will we have left? And when we look back at Jesus' birthday, it in fact may very well have seemed to be a burden on Mary and Joseph. I mean, we have, to, we have to sometimes think about what was going on in those times, this unexpected pregnancy in this teen woman. Mary went away, maybe because her parents sent her away. Maybe it was, maybe it was time for, you know, Joseph almost gave up, right, Joseph? Joseph was not happy about this news that he received. It, he, he very well could have given up. This pregnancy was not received with good news initially. So there's, there's this mixture of joy and anxiety. So maybe it was a good thing for, for Mary to go away. Maybe all the parties needed to get away from each other. To sort this this thing out, to, to sort this message out. And for Mary, fortunately for Mary, she had somewhere to go. She could go and visit her cousin Elizabeth. Because the Lord knows what her neighbors in Nazareth were going to be saying about her. And we read in, in their scripture how Elizabeth greeted her, Blessed are you, the mother of my Lord. It was a joyous occasion for them. But that's not what some of the other people, the other people, this, this sudden pregnancy would not have been accepted by outsiders. In fact, instead of saying happy birthday, it would have been more like, cursed are you. Cursed are you. You have brought this fate upon this family. That wasn't the case with Elizabeth. Elizabeth welcomed Mary in. 
And even Mary had a question mark about why is this happening to me? And we know how they, they shared this conversation about Elizabeth's baby, John the Baptist, and Mary's baby, Jesus, the Savior of the world. This birth could not have happened if it not had been the faith of Elizabeth and Mary. It would have been more of a burden than a joyous occasion. But they saw in this birth the promise from God. They saw God's glory working in it. And we have, we have a problem, I think, sometimes today of seeing where God is working in our lives. I mean, it's, it's hard to see where God is working in the midst of, of all we read and hear and in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of, of this, this deep separation between the parties, between the people of the United States, it can be hard to see where is God working in the midst of all of this. In the midst of, of, this, of these material things that we solicit, it's hard to see this gift the Holy Spirit working in our lives. Because Christmas for so many people has begun, begin to become this onslaught of, of acquiring material goods, of, of buying everything we, we need to get so that, that Johnny and Susie can have all of the best of everything that we never had. And so we, we find ourselves going down this road of, of celebrating and, and buying and putting ourselves in debt. And if we're not celebrating in that way, we, we may be simply complaining about Christmas. We complain about the Christmas trees going up in department stores before Halloween. Or we complain about Rudolph the Red-Nosed reindeer and, reindeer and I Saw Mommy Kissing Santa Claus drowning out the song of O Come All He Faithful or Silent Night. Or maybe we complain about all this extravagant decorations outside the houses and the inflatable Santa Clauses and snowmen on the front lawns. And we, and we complain that this holy day has been hijacked. It's no longer a celebration of Jesus' birthday. And while all of that can be true, all of that is a true observation, if we let it, if we let it, we let that distaste of our, of our U-tied materialism, if we let that win, then we have simply lost. And Christmas becomes a burden for us. But as we get closer to that day, Understand that, that we have the opportunity to fight that. We can we get sidetracked by the, the secularism of, of Christmas if we want. We can simply surrender and give in. Say our shallow season greetings. Or we can take the other step and, and we can fight against all this materialism, and we will lose that battle, most likely. Or we can, we can do something else. We can, we can simply take these last remaining days of Advent, put a smile on our face, remembering what the season is all about, all the time remaining faithful, to this coming birth of the Savior. The mother, one mother says, as she was asking, how do you celebrate Christmas with your family and your children? In response to this, she says, I try to teach him a sort of spiritual discernment, not only during Christmas, but 
but all of the days in the life. And so instead of asking them when, when they come home from school or when they come inside, I, I, instead of asking them, how has your day been? I asked them the question, where have you seen God today? My question to you, where have you seen God today? Instead of asking each other every single day, how's your day? How would our world change if we asked the question, where have you seen God today? So I'm here to tell you, when you start to focus on where you can see God today, you will see God today. If we will only open our eyes to see where God is working in and around and through our lives every single day, not just at Christmas. And so our kids responded. One day I saw, I saw the teacher who helped me. I, I saw a homeless person. I saw a tree with lots of flowers in it. I, I see God in so many places. In these few remaining days of Advent, my challenge to you, instead of asking, how's your day? Ask the question, where have you seen God today? We're going to get ready to see God in action as our children perform our children's program. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. This is so lame. You don't like Christmas? No, no. Christmas is fine, I guess. But this manger nativity stable thing again. I love this tradition. It's a sign that Christmas is coming. I'm so glad our class does this. 
right up there with putting up the tree, Christmas music, snow, and hot cocoa. That's what I mean, same old, same old, every year. Don't you get tired of it? Merry Christmas, kids. Great to see you here. Is that Mr. Walker? A school crossing guard? What's he doing here? Well, hello, Owen. Merry Christmas. Hi, Mr. W. Hi, Mr. Walker. I didn't know you worked here. Season's greetings, Hope. Well, you can't be in school all the time now, can you? So I volunteer to lead kids through the nativity. It's kind of like the school drop-off zone, only here we watch out for camels, not cars. Get it? Camels. camels. What a fun place to work. Makes sense. No school. Christmas vacation. At least Christmas is good for a break from school. And a joyous Noel to you, Andrew. Are you ready for the tour? Ready as I'll ever be. Fantastic. Now, everyone, catch your breath, line up, and follow the signs. We're going on a journey to Bethlehem. Mr. Walker, I've always wondered why baby Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Wasn't Jerusalem the most important city? Excellent question, Hope. Oh, uh, this tour is going to take me eternity. Well, I hope so, Andrew. Now, about Bethlehem, did you know that there are many signs in the Old and New Testaments of the Bible? that point to Bethlehem as the birthplace of Jesus. We just studied that in our Sunday school class. It's in the book of Micah chapter five. But you, Bethlehem, Epirath, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me, who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Great job, Lauren. But how did Joseph and Mary get there? Or even know they should go to Bethlehem in the first place? I know that one too, it's in the book of Luke. <sighs> Okay, to summarize, that verse says the Romans demanded that every person get counted, so everyone had to go to their hometown to sign up. So, Hope, what do you suppose was Joseph's hometown then? Bethlehem! Exactly. Isn't it just like God to work things out, so Joseph and Mary just had to go to Bethlehem, and the timing just happened to be while Mary was expecting the baby Jesus. That could have just been a coincidence. True, it could have been, but let's follow a few more signs before you make up your mind. After all, there's a Roman census underway, and we need to get moving to Bethlehem.
Now we're in Bethlehem. Yeah, we are. But as you may know from the Christmas story, there were no hotel rooms for Joseph and Mary. They had to end up in a stable. Aww. That's not a good sign. After baby Jesus was born, they wrapped him tightly in strips of cloth and made him a bed in a manger. That's a feed trough for animals. An important detail, right, Mr. W? Very much so. You know what I've always wondered? Oh, boy. What's that, Hope? How'd they know to name the baby? Owen, do you know this one? Yes. Uh, of course he does. <laughs> in Matthew 1.20, an angel told Joseph about the baby Mary was expecting. The angel said, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Well done. Did you know the angel was referring to a verse from the Old Testament? In Isaiah, it says, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. That means God is with us. A sign. It's so cool. Right. Now that's the Christmas spirit, Hope. What do you think, Andrew? It's cool, I guess. It's cool, I guess. Do you have, like, maybe a different opinion? Actually, I think it's sort of beautiful.
tourists of Bethlehem, hang on to your hats. I believe we're about to see some shepherds, but watch out for the sheep. Shepherds? Do you ever think about being a lonely shepherd? How scary it would see to be how scary it would be to see angels just sitting there in the dark of the sheep and suddenly BAM! See angels? I love those verses. What verses? Luke 2, 8 and 9. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. You were in every possible Bible award, didn't you, Lauren? Maybe. <laughs> what did the angel say again? Luke 2:10 10, 10 through 12. I bring you good news, though, over in great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah. The Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Okay, not bad. Not bad? This is the best nativity ever. Then what happened, Mr. W? Well, the shepherds raced into Bethlehem to see if what the angel said was true. Ooh, look! They found the sign, just like the angel said. A baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. And then the shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they have heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. What verse is that? Luke 2.20. Amazing. Wonderful. And there you have it. So that's it. It's just over. That's all there is to Christmas. Oh, Andrew, this is just the beginning of the story. God sent us Jesus at Christmas, but that was just the first part of the road trip. Jesus grew into a man, trained his followers, worked miracles, healed people, taught about God's love, showed us how to live and how to love God back. But then according to God's plan, he was put to death on a cross. Jesus died and took the punishment for everything we have ever done wrong. The whole reason he was born was to die. God wrote down the signs of what would happen 
all through the Bible. But that wasn't the last sign, was it, Mr. Walker? Not at all. Jesus rose back to life. That signified his victory over sin and death. And he told us that there was only one way to get to God. all along the way. Tell us what the signs were, kids. That there would be a Messiah who would take away our sins. Who was born with the His name be Savior and God with us. And he would his life on the cross and come back to us. And the reason for all of it, the reason for Christmas, is that God loves us. Oh yeah, I've got this one. John 3.16 says, For this is how God loved the world. He gave His one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. That's right. There is only one way to heaven. Only one way to know your sins are forgiven. And that's by believing in God's Son. What do you say, Andrew? I'd say all the signs of Christmas have pointed me to Jesus.
Wonderful job, wonderful job. Doug, if you would come down, and Andrew and Hope, if you could bring one of those microphones down. If you come down here, and Janice, if you would come up, and Leanne, if you would come up, and Jim Spur, if you would come up, please. Yep. Jim? Jim was running the soundboard, so Jim, come up, and Andrew and Hope, I think you have something. It said it takes a village to raise a child. Today, you have proven you are a part of that village. Thank you very much for your guidance and direction of this Christmas program. Please accept these small gifts from those of us in this village. Now, if you if you can't tell, all the kids signed them. The no tree, so. I give it to you. I'm going to ask Stephanie if she would make her way up, if she's there already. We're going to, and if you would all stand. Don't do that. As the kids make their way back now, there, there's some, some candy canes that they're going to hand out to everybody as you leave, so make sure you get a candy cane. Let us you stand as you're able as we sing our closing hymn. you can leave this place knowing the answer to that question where have you seen God today may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day go in peace share the good news God is alive amen and amen